Welcome to Good Game, your no BS insights for crypto founders. Boring types of assets, but assets that like don't have liquid secondary markets and like don't have that many players that are securitizing them in traditional finance. Think about like auto loan market, SMB receivables, trade financing, like these types of things that aren't like as huge as like treasuries or mortgage backed securities or like high grade corporate debt, but are maybe a little sleepier, probably a little more efficient cost structures. That's kind of like where I think like protocols will maybe have, and the crowdsourcing that comes with protocols might have like the biggest efficiency gains. Looking for your next startup idea in crypto? Check out our request for startups list and get inspired at alliance.xyz forward slash ideas. Welcome to Good Game. We took some time off. Uh, I think it's important, uh, especially running this podcast for over a year now, uh, that we take some time off and start to do some deep research and understanding where we see the future. So, um, and we also had a demo day with Alliance, which turned out to be incredible for the founders that we're, we're backing. So overall, I thought it was fun and uh, good to take some time off. So what are we going to talk about today, Imran? Uh, real world assets. Yes, I see a lot of tweets every day about it and why it's the future of, of, of finance. You have the chain link Marines that are gearing up for their narrative. <laughs> I, I hear it humming. I hear it humming. Uh, they've been wanting a narrative for a very long time. They're dying and they need it. And I think we might have one for them. You could see Sergey, you know, going on to many, many podcasts and talking about how Chainlink will enable traditional finance on chain. You're starting to see Robert Leshner, who uh, launched his company Superstate, which we can talk a bit more about. We're seeing some uptick in some of the DeFi protocols that are, are that have launched around the real world asset space such as Ando and others that have upticked in volume, including MakerDAO. And it seems like all the signals to me is pointing up. Uh, but the question is, what is this space? How does it look like? Where does it go? What's the regulatory framework look like? And you know, where, where should founders build? And so those are the things that I'm thinking about as we talk about RWAs. Uh, how do you feel about real-world assets? I mean, to me, I'll be quite frank. Doing research around real-world assets and all of that was very boring. <laughs> and and f- <laughs> I don't know what it is. Like, I mean, when by, you're talk- by definition, it's a boring asset class, like TrapFi, by, def- by definition for us. But you know what that implies about you, Imran? That means you're, you're not a boomer. Ah, well, that's great news. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, you know, like, I guess when you, when you talk about friend tech or, I don't know, YOLOing into Harry ba- uh, Potter, Obama, Sonic, and others, you know, there's certain types of like synapses that go off in my brain that gets me excited. But then when you talk about YOLOing into treasury bills, I don't know, corporate stocks or corporate bonds or municipal bonds. I mean, I start yawning. <laughs> so I did a lot of research and uh, I uh, assure your, your feeling, but the research was also pretty illuminating. Yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously a few months ago, we talked about RWAs and we said that uh, our view actually evolved over time and what really triggered that evolution. So previously we were actually fairly bearish, but what triggered a, a change of mind was a few months ago when we saw Maker and the collateral that underlies DAI growing at an extremely rapid pace. So to give you some data, around December and January, December 2020, 2022 and January 2023, the uh, dollar amount of RWAs that is a maker that's, that backs DAI, the stablecoin, has grown from basically zero to $3 billion, $3 billion in less than a year. And then at the same time, we've seen you know, protocols like Ondo that you mentioned and, and others that have grown their TVL to uh, over $100 million very quickly. And so these data points, we just cannot ignore them. And on top of that, there is an elephant in the room, which is stablecoins. Obviously, stablecoins are an RWA because it's it's a tokenized U.S. dollar, right? And so Peter Johnson from um, mm-hmm. uh, BH Digital, Digital um, he published um, a research paper on stablecoins a few months ago. And there are some really interesting findings. I'll quote him. For example, in 2022, uh, stablecoins settled over $11 trillion on-chain. $11 trillion. That's insane. That's insane. Dwarfing the volumes processed by PayPal, which is $1.4 trillion. 
almost surpassing the payment volume of Visa, which is 11 trillion, and reaching 14% of the volume settled by ACH and 1% of the volume settled by Fedwire. It is remarkable that in just a few years, a new global money movement rail can be compared to some of the world's largest and most important payment system. So that's one. Mm -hmm. And I'll also quote a few very interesting uh, anecdotes from uh, anecdotal data points from that report. And that, okay. that might really surprise our audience just for fun. Okay. Now, given what I just said, the, the audience uh, could argue that, well, you know, the, probably much of the $11 trillion that's settled on chain is for spec speculative reasons. They're like, I, I don't know, like people settling stable coins on a centralized exchange and then trading and stuff like that. And then, you know, participating in yields and stuff like that. Sure, you can argue that. And, and it's probably true. But here's another really interesting data point. Again, I'm quoting Peter. Stablecoin usage has decoupled from crypto exchange volumes, indicating that significant stablecoin transaction volumes may be driven by non-trading and speculative activity. Since December 2021, centralized exchanges volumes are down 64%, and decentralized exchange volumes are down 60%. During the same period, stablecoin volumes are only down 11%. And weekly active stablecoin addresses and transactions are up 25%. Product market fit. Product market fit. And I'm going to share some more interesting data points uh, just for fun. Okay. The majority of stablecoin activity uses Tether. Tether represents 69% of stablecoin supply and accounting for 80% of weekly active addresses. This is not surprising, right? But it, it is still fun. Like most people expect USD, USDC to be the dominant player. But it is actually tethered today. And a lot of that has had to do with the, the banking crisis earlier this year in, in April. Uh, and, and USDC uh, depegged from that. Another really interesting data point. Most stablecoin activity occurs on the Tron and the BSC blockchains. Mic drop, Justin. <laughs> Mic drop, Justin. Year to date, the Tron and BSC blockchains collectively account for 77% of weekly active addresses, 75% of transactions, and 41% of volumes. How did Tron get there? Uh, I'm I'm very surprised. Uh, like, they they did no like direct marketing, and and where is this happening? Is this a uh, Latam? No. Okay. So the there there is arguments and counter arguments or data points against and for. So the argument against Tron is okay. May, maybe most of that volume is just Justin's own own wallet, right? Like just mm -hmm. creating fake fake transactions. I have no idea if that's true or not, but people have said that. The counterpoint is we know for a fact. From talking to Felipe, who's building Cravada, who's part of our program. Cravada, by the way, is a fiat on, on our ramp for Latin America. He's very deep in, in that, in that um, market. And he told us that Tron USDT is by far the number one crypto payment that is used in Latin America. So the way people do, the way people transact with each other is people go to like Binance peer to peer and then they initiate a transaction person uh, on Binance peer to peer. And then they meet each other in person to give each other Tron USDT and also fiat back. So they use like native Tron wallet. So I don't know. The, the adoption seems real. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, I mean, like obviously we'll have to do more research on this, but how did Tron get a foothold into, into that market and other markets as well? It's just something that we'd, I'd love to do more research on and get insights on. And for those who are listening that are building any sort of crypto payment startups talk to us. We are extremely bullish. And I think the, you know, obviously in, in the past five to 10 years, there have been many attempts uh, at crypto payments um, businesses and they all failed. There is a historical reason for that, I think. So like, for example, many years ago, you invested in a Latin American remittance and, you know, payment. Yeah, five years um, ago. Five years ago. And, but, but what changed in the last five years? Well, there are two things that changed. One is five years ago, Bitcoin was the only liquid settlement layer. And Bitcoin is not really a good settlement layer for two reasons. One is the price is very volatile. And two, the block time is very long. It's quite long. It takes an hour to really fully settle. And the second reason is, well, obviously, the stable coins have really taken off. So today, there are enough wallets and enough on-chain wealth that is stored in stable coins. And, and, and now we really have a critical mass of users that can pay each other. I'm going to throw a third reason too, which is the uh, infrastructure that enables this to happen. Here's a good example. The, the startup that I invested in uh, five years ago, back then, there was a, a very different mindset where everything had to be built on Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin was the de facto way to build around. It, it created a lot of mindshare because 
you know, Bitcoin was kind of pretty dominant at that point. That's number one. Number two is like there wasn't like enough stablecoin activity, right, to really deem any one stablecoin successful. So the founder that I invested in also built their own type of stablecoin that's backed by BTC, right? So that's number two. The number three is there was no on and off ramps in LATAM. So they also had to build their own on and off ramp in LATAM. And in LATAM, there's, you know, 30 plus countries that all have different jurisdictions that have all different legal requirements around how on and off ramps should be processed. And different banking systems. Different banks, different banking systems. So that was number three, right? Uh, and let's throw number four, crypto infrastructure, right? We didn't have you know, account abstracted wallets. We didn't have on and off ramps that, were, that was directly integrated with wallets, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel as if a lot, all of those have been validated now and there is a decent solution for it. And that's one of the reasons why Cravada, was, who was a part of our last batch, is really solving that across the LATAM market. And they grew 20 times this year. That's that, right. That just goes to show the, the, the amount of demand for stablecoins. That's right. Uh, US dollar stablecoins in that time. That's right. So I think with all of that being solved, now we have a real world asset that is finding utility and, there's, and they're commercializing that utility through products and startups, which is what some of these startups that, that we're talking to are doing, which is cross-border so, so there's, there's a broader, very yeah. important point about what you just said, which is uh, timing matters. In my over 10 years of observing crypto products and startup ideas, I don't think I've seen like actually bad ideas, but most mm-hmm. ideas that failed actually were just too early. And so stablecoin is an example. But another really good example is basically the rest of the RWS, all the real world assets. Um, because if you think about it, okay, you can be, we, we can all be really bullish on RWS, but if you really think about it, every asset that you see in front of you, like including this computer that, that you're watching this, this uh, podcast from, right? Like it can be tokenized, of course. But does it actually make sense to tokenize this computer today? Maybe no. at some point, yes, but today, uh, of course not, right? So there is a path dependency and there's a thing about timing, which is why stablecoins has worked really well so far. And the next obvious one that has worked is on-chain treasuries, which you mentioned, T-bills, basically, US T-bills which you mentioned that Undone and others have um, gotten pretty good traction. And then the next obvious question is, what are some of the other asset classes for which it makes sense to tokenize today? And in order to answer this question, we need to critically ask ourselves, where does the demand come from? Because demand, I think, is actually the number one problem, the, num- the number one hurdle. The other hurdle is the legal, the, the, the custodian, all that stuff, the, the, the actual solution. How do you solve this problem? How do you put stuff on chain? But before that can even be thought about, you need to think about the demand. Where does the demand come from? If we tokenize real estate, who, who buys that? Like if you, if you tokenize yeah. a single property, by the way, here's another really interesting anecdote, which is yeah. David, David on our team. David Ma. David Ma on our team, he built a tokenized real estate startup back in 2017. He did? They, oh, I didn't know that. Then they pivoted into the AI startup, oh, that's which right. was sold for yeah. 60 million. But their first idea was, was tokenized real estate and it didn't work out. And asked David, why, why do you think that, that didn't work? I think he said to, something to the effect of if you tokenize individual properties, yeah. there's just no liquidity. People don't want to have exposure to individual properties. Cause if you want exposure to in, in, individual properties, you just can't, you can just buy stuff. On, you can just buy a property on, on Zillow or whatever. Just find a real estate agent and buy from them. Mm-hmm. But when you're someone who's on chain, you have some money and you want to diversify that money into, you want to buy something with the money. Yeah. What you want is not an exposure to a single property. What you want maybe is exposure to a broad group of real estates. Let's say Reach. real estate in New York, real estate in Chicago, and then you can long New York and short Chicago and so on and so forth. So point being, we need to ask ourselves, is the timing right for, for a given asset class? Well, I will argue that that I think the timing is right to tokenize treasury bills. And it might be the right narrative or tailwind that RWAs need outside of stablecoins to grow the asset class. You could say that the macro backdrop, if you look at the macro backdrop, you know, Powell's increasing rates, and this is fundamentally hurting all of the risk on assets like crypto, right? In fact, it's crushing it <laughs> compared to what's happening in, 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 uh, in any other market. 
But you could also flip it and say that, well, because there's no yield, the, the decent yield on chain, the yield that's coming from treasury bills, if tokenized properly, could be a way to bring in more TVL into the broader crypto ecosystem. And in fact, that could bring be a, a tailwind for other startups to build around this ecosystem and start to grow from that perspective. And I think that's why we're getting a lot of narrative. The narrative buildup on real world assets is starting to increase. It's because of that. Yeah. So, I mean, again, timing matters because if you started Which a, is, yeah. a, a T-bill tokenization platform five years ago, you wouldn't have worked because the federal fund rate was zero five years ago, but now it's five. And if you can get 5% on chain, whereas on Aave and Compound, you can only get by the way, like zero, one, or two percent, of course you're gonna pick the T bill, the on-chain T bill, because it's higher rate, it's actually safer from a, a duration point of view, and you're not taking any smart contract risk. And if you think about it, I also think the other reason for this is like, yeah, I mean, if you're just holding dollars right now, it's fine, but you're still like there's an opportunity cost that you're losing by not doing T bills. Uh, and if there's thirty eight billion dollars, I think I saw the number on DeFi Llama, thirty eight billion dollars in TBL, let's say. I mean, that's $38 billion that's not earning a yield, right? And so they're switching costs in getting that money out off ramp and then being able to go to a bank or brokerage and buying that. They're, they're switching time costs. There's a lot of issues with doing that. There is no seamless process. And there is a chance that you could, there's security issues and vulnerabilities too by doing this, especially large sums of money. So it actually really makes sense for some of that money to go into RWAs, mm -hmm. which makes it easier from a switching cost perspective. If I could um, rephrase what you said, well, actually, I'm just going to quote David again, because I've been talking to David a lot about this. Okay. Um, if, if I could summarize the thesis behind RWAs, like basically what the question is, what would be the potential reasons for RWAs mm -hmm. product market fit? Well, there's, there's two sides of the same coin. Number one, one side of the coin is you have a lot of this on-chain non-KYC wealth that needs diversification. So you and me and maybe some organizations, some DAOs, we have some money on chain. You know, we historically over the last 15 years, we went from BTC, then to ETH, then to stables, then to treasuries. And then the natural next question is, what else can we diversify into? So obviously you can have a bunch of other real world assets on chain that we can potentially diversify into. So, so the need comes from on chain treasury tra diversification. And then the other side of the same coin is, the RWA is, is basically a way for traditional assets to tap into cheaper liquidity sources. Yes. Or, or adverse selection, so to speak. What that means is if you're a TradFi person or organization, you can't raise money in that world. Well, why don't you just uh, tap into the DGEN liquidity on chain? Because that money is less informed and they wouldn't ape into anything. Right. So these are two coins, two sides of the same coin, because one side is supply, the, the other side is demand. Yes. And, and they match perfectly with each other. Um, so, so that's the thesis behind RWS. Now, again, back to timing. Is the timing right for a given asset class? Imran, I'm, I'm curious what you think. But let's go through a list of, of asset classes, and then we can share our thoughts. So first one, I don't know. Uh, bonds. Bonds. What kind of bonds, by the way? Like co commercial debt, uh, real? Like, obviously, U.S. government Co bonds. Commercial? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, U.S. too? I, I don't know. To be honest, because U.S. Treasuries is already five percent. Um, yeah. With commercial like bonds, like corporate bonds, maybe you can yield a little bit more than that by taking on extra risk. But it's, I mean, yes. So corporate bonds offers you a combination of two risks. The first risk is the federal fund rate plus some default risk. So it does offer something new. So maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe some people will want it. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm looking at one of the pools here. I've seen a pool uh, with uh, ABS, asset-backed securities, which is really degen. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how they did it, they, but they, they tokenized, I think it was on Centrifuge, and one of the vaults on Centrifuge. Oh, it was Centrifuge. Yeah. I AWS was on chain. And, I, and it's, by the way, it's, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but that vault is used by Maker. Yes. The die, the, yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I, I mean, I did see commercial real estate also. Yeah, I so saw real estate, yeah, really emerging markets, ideas. emerging markets at 10%, structured credit, 4%, real estate um, around 8%, commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's some like uh, interesting yield opportunities, but I mean, obviously they all come with their own risk, 
parameters. Yeah. But that increases the yield opportunity because if you think about what drove DeFi summer, it was primarily yield, wasn't it? Yeah. Like, People would just compare different yield opportunities no, and they would just that, yield. Yeah, yeah exactly. That was I mean, it was a different that. time. It was a different time. Right? 10,000, 100,000% yield versus uh, yeah. 100% yield. Like the rebasing <laughs> stable coins. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> uh, good times. Oh, well, Imran, here, here's a few fun ones because we, we went through a bunch of boring ones like the Trafi Boomer stuff, but here's a few fun ones Pokemon cards and, and uh, Magic the Gathering cards and Michael Jordan cards. <sighs> yes. Um, Obviously, like we, we chatted offline about this, but I'm quite bullish uh, on at least, you know, cards because um, I'm a pretty big uh, collector of Jordan. Uh, I own a lot of his cards. And some of the biggest issues that I have with holding cards at home is the fact that they could damage, they, they can get damaged by humidity, heat, etc. And it, it could get stolen and it could get damaged too. Like if you have, you know, pets or kids, you know, you have to store it somewhere safe. And so there's a lot of risk involved in storing this at home. And so having a custodian that could store it in a very cost-effective way that can also uh, keep the quality high, like temperature-controlled rooms, secured within a some sort, sort of like vault, and having some sort of digital representation on the internet, like an NFT that is backed by this company like Brinks, could give me the optionality to sell it if I want to sell it quickly or borrow against it if I want to borrow against it, or do other things uh, like show, showing it off. So I do think there is some value in like holding like very high valued collectibles like like Jordan. Yeah, you're a Pokemon. About- weren't you a Magic the Gathering? Uh, like, weren't you involved in trading those cards? Should so, I, I mean, let the community know. Let the people know. Uh, when it's I was okay. in high school, I was extremely poor. Uh, all my friends play Magic the Gathering with real cards, real Magic the Gathering cards. Yeah, I wanted to play with them. But I, I didn't have the money to buy the real cards. Uh-huh. I just printed them. Nice. I printed the cards, black and white. So you did what uh, Powell would do at this point, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, the thing with all, all these, like you know, Magic the Gathering or, or Pokemon or Michael Jordan, it's, it, it taps into your 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 childhood, your nostalgia. Yeah. By the way, you, have you seen like how much Magic the Gathering cards have appreciated in the last 20, 30 years? I have not. You, when I was in high school, a Black Lotus, uh, for those who are into Black, Magic the Gathering, Black Lotus is the most expensive card in Ma- Magic the Gathering. I don't know if it's still the case today, but it was $700 20 years ago. Today, it's like five figures. Jeez. And, and you know why? I, like, I, I thought about this for a long time, and I, I finally realized that, that why that has appreciated so much, which is that when we were young, we were all poor. But as all of us, that, that generation, like millennials or whatever, the boomers are in, are in their 30s or 40s or whatever, they, ha- they now have some wealth and they, yeah. they want to go back to their childhood and, mm. and buy that stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's a I, good I, I uh, would own a tokenized Magic the Black Lotus. Yeah. Or a Charizard for Pokemon. Charizard. Imagine, I, I mean, uh, I, I collected Pokemon cards. And uh, Charizard was the uh, the one I always wanted. So yeah, I think just to go back to nostalgia, I, I would definitely buy one of the. I, I would buy Charizard, uh, tokenized Charizard. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Magic Eden they they announced this uh, product like last week or something, where people can buy pretty rare ma- uh, Pokemon cards. Uh, I, I, I saw, saw a Charizard one, a very rare one. Yeah. Interesting. Um, on a side note, the biggest bearish person that I know about crypto. This Nikita Bear, right? Like yep. people call him the product god, and maybe he is, but he's probably the biggest bear in crypto. There's an interesting tweet that he just shared that said, I don't believe in crypto, but with the debt levels where they are at and World War Three unfolding, I'm not sure what else I can believe in. Yeah. Crypto is the end state. By the way, gold went back to $2,000 today. Uh-huh. After being, I, I know this is a boomer asset class, you don't care about it, but gold just went back to almost all time high. Flirting with all-time high. I think some people on-chain would, would, would want to own some gold, tokenized gold. They do. And I think PAX, uh, PAX, uh, PAX, PAX has PAX yeah. gold. There's PAX gold. So there is some. And I think that's it's in the RC20. So you can actually buy that on Uniswap. Yep. From what I remember. And that's another. I mean, I'm just thinking about the demand. Uh, like the, the story I was trying to put to this is like, you know, with World War Three. Let, let's say what Nikita Bear says. Okay, World War Three. I have no other asset class I want to hold. But Bitcoin. Right, because it's a global currency. What's his name? Uh, Fink, the 
Larry Fink Larry from, Fink. Uh, yeah. He also said, you he know, the, the only, shit out of Bitcoin. He pamped it so well that I just went and bought one spot BTC just, just for him. <laughs> 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 but if you think about it, there's the, uh, the macro headwinds, right? And the macro headwinds right now is raising in- interest rates. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. We, we're all yield chasers and we're going to, uh, we're going to run to T bills. But the other larger macro backdrop is, is like what's happening in, in other parts of the world. And there isn't like a one unified currency that anyone can purchase right now. And I think that's obviously going to be Bitcoin. And that's what Larry Fink said recently about, about Bitcoin. Um, and that's another large narrative driver that was going to bring these like, uh, these investors into, into Bitcoin and, and on chain activity. So it's interesting to see where all of this goes in the future. Yeah. Here's a uh, one last fun one. What do you think of carbon credits? Because technically that, that is also a real world asset. Yeah. Uh, Glow is, uh, you know, David's company and, uh, another I think, David, uh, uh, David, uh, Boric. David Boric. So there's the concept of, uh, tracking carbon offsets and then burning carbon offset, uh, carbon offsets to show that different companies can run carbon neutral, as an example. Many companies run carbon plus, so they're emitting a lot of carbon, and that could be bad for the environment, as an example. And so what what these companies do is they purchase carbon offsets as a way to offset the carbon that they're emitting. So that's kind of the way carbon offsets work. So there are startups like Glow that are tokenizing carbon offsets so that enterprises and companies could buy that carbon offset and burn it as an example, so that yep. they're carbon neutral. And, and they have real traction from, from real demand from hedge funds and other companies asking for on-chain uh, carbon credits. And the idea of tokenized carbon credits is very interesting for another reason, which is that um, I wrote about this um, a few months ago. One potential bear case for tokenized asset is that if that asset, that if it's a traditional, a, a traditional finance asset, already has a very liquid secondary market, let's say stocks, it's less likely for it to, to succeed on chain because there, there's already a, a very liquid marketplace for people to trade. But if there's an asset class for which there's not already a, a very liquid secondary marketplace, then the value proposition of putting it on chain all of a sudden becomes extremely large because you can just trade it on permissionless protocols like Uniswap, let's say. Yeah. That's why tokenized carbon credits is really interesting because Carbon credits doesn't already have a very liquid secondary market in the real world. Interesting. There's some things that you said that stood out to me. One is like, if I want to buy carbon offset credits, I don't even know where to, where to, where to start. Exactly. And from what I've read and heard, there are a couple marketplaces for carbon offset credits and the prices are all over the place. That's number two. Number three is the quality of the carbon offset credit. We don't know the rating of the carbon offset credit, right? Is it really 100% tracking the carbs, carbon offset of where it was originated from. So they have a, mm-hmm. a third party company that values these carbon offsets to determine whether the quality is high or low. And then it gets put on a marketplace, right? And then people can per- companies like Microsoft and others can purchase this and show to the public that they're carbon neutral. But there isn't really a way to track any of this. It's done all off chain. It's done through paperwork. Somebody comes in and investigates and, and does this. But you could do all of this on chain, put it up in, on, on, on a layer one like Ethereum or, or uh, on Uniswap and allow the market to provide discovery in terms of pricing and create one unified marketplace. That's very easy. That sounds really cool to me. Yep. 100%. And you could buy it and then you could get a loan against it. <laughs> and, and by the way, this is the other really important uh, value prop of RWAs, which is composability with the, the other DeFi protocols. So imagine you have hypothetically, you have Apple shares on chain. Well, now you can put it on Aave and, or not Aave specifically, but a per- permissionless lending protocol and borrow some money against it, which is much harder in, in TradFi, by the way. You can borrow money off of your Apple shares, but not everyone can do it. And there's some really, there, there's a lot of frictions with it. So here's another thought uh, exercise I want to, I want to give you DeFi. There was no narrative for DeFi. After for a very long time, right? Like if you look at the DeFi TVL, let's say 38 billion, you know, you could say they're all like crypto natives as an example. And for a very long time, for the past three years, we were trying to figure out how do we get DeFi to the hands of the everyday user? 
Uh, and so we talked to Kane about this and Kane said, yeah, we know we need to create a consumer app or something of that nature that brings in more people, right? Like a neobank app or, or whatever that makes it easy for anyone to interact in DeFi. But it also seems as if RWAs could indirectly bring in ins- different types of institutions or constituents in these different types of sectors, which could create a whole different onboarding flywheel that we haven't seen yet. Is that true? What do you think about the consumer versus the institutions, the RWA institutions versus like the DeFi as a mullet, Bology, Kane thesis? Yeah, I mean, of course, not, if you put more assets on chain and there's more options for, for institutions and individuals to ape into. Yeah. So yeah, of course, that will drive potentially more, more onboarding. Which one are you bullish or bearish on is the question. Are you which, bullish? Which a consumer versus institution. Consumers for, de- first. For, for, for DeFi. Consumers first. Why is that? Uh, l- less, less friction internally, less compliance, like, you know, compliance officer telling me, hey, you can't do this because it's blah, blah, blah. But individuals from, let's say, emerging markets, they don't have access to super high quality assets. Their, you know, currency goes down 5% a year. They don't have stocks that go up like the US stocks do. Yeah, of course, th- they would want to, to buy some stuff on chain, some, some RWS on chain. I see. Okay. Okay, so we talked about bonds, real estate, gold, collectibles. Oh, okay, let's talk about MakerDAO. So MakerDAO's endgame, uh, if you read his uh, Ruins Manifesto, uh, talks about creating uh, a new brand, this new MakerDAO brand. So it won't be Maker or Die anymore. It'll be a new brand. It's a new code name. Okay. On Solana, is that right? I, I think uh, it's not on Solana. It's going to use Solana's virtual machine. Virtual machine, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to have its own chain. And the reason for it actually quite makes a lot of sense, uh, which is if decisions were made that uh, like large maker holders were to uh, governance attack maker, then he has the ability to roll back the chain. That's his primary re- reason for doing that. He as in himself. Well, he meaning like the community, like the community, oh. there's right. Not, not like, you know, Lord Vitalik back in the day when he, uh, when remember that reentrancy attack that happened with the DAO and yeah, so it won't be that, but you know the community that wants to govern the protocol in a in an efficient manner, you may have a adversarial attacker that will attack the governance and say like, all right, give me ten million dollars worth of maker, right? Mm-hmm. So they can roll back the chain is is the idea behind it. And he says this is the final end state for security. Mm-hmm. Thoughts. I mean, and I'll talk about the real world assets around around what Maker's doing, but I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this. No thoughts. I don't, okay. I don't actually get it. But yeah, talk about the RWAs. Okay. So you see, uh, so Maker has these new tokens that will represent the new Maker, the new DAI, and they're going to create sub DAOs. And they're going to be, there's going to be like six sub DAOs, two are facilitator DAOs, and four are allocator DAOs. And these allocator DAOs are going to be given stable coins as a way to try to generate more yield. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he said in a manifesto, this is going to make MakerDAO one of the most flexible DAO products that are out there. And I think I know where he's going with this. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but think about it this way. There's four sub DAOs. The first sub DAO could be primarily focused on buying T-bills. Second sub DAO could be municipal bonds. Third sub DAO could be commercial real estate. And you can start to see where he's going with this. They're essentially SPV or special purpose vehicles that enable Maker to extend its capital base into on ch- like real world assets. Mm-hmm. And then like buying Maker would give you the ability to get exposure on all of those things that they're extending to. Okay. And, and obviously there's the DeFi component to this, but like, and, and so each of these sub DAOs, they will have their own token. Mm-hmm. So it's very likely a sub DAO that has T bills would be a maker T bill token. That would try. It basically g- gives the the DeFi DGens a, a a lot of options of diversified portfolios from TradFi that they can a- ape into. ETFs. ETFs exactly. On chain ETFs. So Maker is becoming the the vanguard or 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 whatever of of crypto. And and Rune is the the layer think of. Or the BlackRock. <laughs> I mean. It's 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 plausible. It makes sense. It makes sense. I did see a bunch of really interesting, like random products on Centrifuge, by the way, and they're all like 
diversified portfolios, like a bunch of things, not just one asset. Yeah, and uh, I, I can I can see this going that that, that way um, in, in the long term. The way I see Centrifuge, it has two hundred and forty five million dollars in TBL. Not bad, right? And I see this as like an open RFQ system or lending product, right? Where people will create pools and for certain, you know, there's a vetting process. Once they get vetted, they can create a pool and say, hey, I'm going to start a commercial real estate pool, as an example, or I want to start a, a receivables for small to medium sized businesses pool. And it brings more institutions here because there's attractive capital base with attractive yields. And it also brings in the demand because people that are participating in those spaces can tap into the liquidity of, of DeFi. So now, the only so, question is whether or not Gary Gensler will let this happen. Nope. <laughs> uh, he's going to come. All right. Well, um, there's a lot that we need to talk about. And uh, we're bringing on Scott Lewis, uh, who is the founder of DeFi Pulse. DeFi app, which is now Slingshot, one of the first buyers of uh, CryptoPunks. In fact, he has probably one of the largest holdings of CryptoPunks. And he uh, launched Kanto, which is a, a layer one off the uh, new Polygon ZK EVM. And he is now setting his sights on real world assets, which is another interesting signal for us to just dive deeper into the space. So we're going to have him on to talk more about why he's bullish on real world assets. Cool. All it. right, let's do it. Welcome to Good Game. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, talking about real world assets. And uh, there has been a growing narrative in the space around real world assets, uh, starting with Centrifuge, MakerDAO with the end game proposal in, uh, I think it was around May. And uh, you're starting to see Maple and other startups that are offering treasury bills to uh, DeFi users and other types of users. So want to learn more about this trend and get a better understanding of where the space is going. And so we're bringing on uh, Scott Lewis, and uh, he has been recently very bullish on real world assets. And I'll talk a bit more about why, but uh, I want to see what Chow has to say before we get started. You know, uh, everywhere I go, every crypto conference I go, these days people talk about two things, friend tech and RWS. <laughs> Those are the only two things people talk about. And yet I haven't really seen like super strong thesis from people like wh why does it actually make sense to tokenize things and put it on chain and, and where does the demand come from what is the legal solution to to this problem right and and so that's why we we have an expert today to to go through this yeah and you know funny enough i, I every time i scroll twitter you see a lot of noobs that will like tweet out like <laughs> traditional assets worth 10 trillion dollars and you know this is why you should long chain link <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, really, we got to figure out, you know, what is the thesis behind real world assets or traditional assets? How do we bring it on chain if, we're, if that's the way? What's the legal regulatory requirements or the frameworks around it? And what is considered real world asset and what isn't considered real world asset? And so we have Scott. Scott, obviously, uh, you've been in the space for a very long time. So if you want to do, do a quick 30 second background check, uh, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, I was a. Uh Trader in traditional finance for 11 years, then kind of fell down the Ethereum rabbit hole late 2016, early 2017. Started as kind of a trader that in, in crypto, then uh, you know, built like a public service site about like uh, ICO scams back in 2017, and then kind of caught the bug to start building stuff. And yeah, I've just like did a handful of uh, startups, and uh, which I'm still active in a, a number of them, and then. Uh, yeah, I was part of the pre-launch contributor group for Canto, which is a layer one that we kind of like, you know, didn't didn't raise any money for. I tried to sort of a bootstrap uh, decentralized launch, um, and yeah, just been been focusing on that and some of the other stuff I co-founded. But I feel like you're a perpetual or serial entrepreneur. You know, you started DeFi Pulse. I remember using DeFi Pulse quite actively very early on in my in my DeFi uh, journey. Especially tracking the TBL. I would use DeFi Pulse to track the, the TBL of DeFi. Back then, it was like, I don't know, 50, 100 million. I remember that. Dexag, which is now Slingshot, yeah. right? Uh, and Slingshot is, you know, probably one of the top apps for, for swaps today. Um, yeah, yeah. Sl Slingshot's been doing great. Yeah, it's been pretty fun. There's going to be a reinvention of Slingshot. I think it's just 
just getting out very privately right now. But I think it's really exciting. And I think it's yep. a paradigm change uh, for like DeFi and on chain interaction. But that'll be, I don't know, I shouldn't announce it here. And then you were pretty early on in NFTs, right? With, uh, I think you were one of the, you know, there's, I would say there's like maybe three groups of people that were in the NFT space, those that caught it very early. Where, you know, like an example is CryptoPunks. People were able to actually mint CryptoPunks around the 2017, 18, 19 period, right? Yeah. Um, and it was available for a very long time to mint and no one really minted it. Well, wait, no. Okay, tell me the history. Uh, okay, so it was on Reddit and it was all free. Yes. And they actually minted out fairly quickly. I saw it on oh, Reddit okay. and was like, that's really cool. But then like one of my companies had a lot of fires that day and so i basically couldn't and i missed i missed it but then about two or three weeks maybe it's more than that actually sort of just really dove into it but you could buy them for very cheap like ten dollars fifteen dollars twenty dollars thirty dollars forty dollars at that time but um it was fun yeah i mean yeah you were very early on crypto punks i came in phase two which was around the five to six eve mark that's around and that was more in the 2019 2020 so you identified DeFi early, you identified NFTs early, and now it seems like a lot of your tweets recently uh, has been around real-world assets. And so I guess the, qu- the first question I'd like to ask is, what are the, some, the signals that you saw in real-world assets that is you know, inclining you to work on this full-time? There are kind of like two types of things that I think are going to be like really disruptive. There's like, this is a completely new idea, and I think if people like it, they might like it a lot. And I think like CryptoPunks and NFTs sort of fit that mold. But but I think for real world assets, it's a completely new way of solving a problem that's very important. Because I think when you look at traditional finance, there are a lot of different ways people get loans, people do finance with each other. Putting everything on chain in protocols like solves a lot of like really important problems in a much cleaner way than currently exists in traditional finance. And so like when I sort of see those things and you see like the potential for like cost reductions and reductions in friction in like how people do business, it just sort of feels like, you know, the, like the default case is that like this was a better way. And there's like a lot of ways that can derail the default case. But like, I don't know, when I see those sort of differences, it's kind of like this could be huge. Scott, just double clicking on that. Uh, can you... Pick an example of a real world asset and describe how exactly putting it on chain solves the problem that um, that exists in, in traditional finance. Just as a counter example, imagine like I hold held like Apple stock, very popular asset. I could put that, I could hold that stock at a brokerage and borrow mar- own that stock on margin, borrow dollars against it. Right, I wouldn't have to put up the full value of each share. Now imagine we own like an asset that does not trade as liquidly on exchanges, right? Like maybe that is like a Puerto Rican sovereign bonds or or Puerto Rican debt, not sovereign, obviously. Um, Or maybe that's just like a small and medium business receivables finance, right? I can like take that to a brokerage and be like, hey... Uh, here's my assets as collateral. Let me borrow against it. I'd like to be long this on margin. It's just like no one does that or no one will do that for me. Maybe if I'm one of the largest hedge funds in the world, Goldman or JP Morgan might do it, um, but it's like pretty restricted. But imagine a different world where we had those like financing from small and medium businesses. Maybe they're collateralized, secured against like like a assets that business owns. And now you just say, hey, I post those as collateral in a protocol and anyone can lend me money. It's like, I'm not just going to a Goldman or JP Morgan. Like I can just crowdsource that. And like, that's something that you can't really do well in the traditional finance, but there's not really reasons why that wouldn't work on the types of protocols that DeFi has been researching and developing over like the last six, five, six years. So let me summarize. Uh, the benefit of tokenizing some of these uh, traditional assets on chain is giving it access to to the open blockchain and therefore the open open liquidity. Basically, giving them more liquidity. Yeah, like yeah, more people can be counterparties with more people, and also things are just like kind of like 
transparent unless you make them not like they're transparent by default. And I think in traditional finance, things are like opaque by default. Yeah. And and kind of like that composability, the, the more less permissioning of the system, it just kind of can work better. Yeah. A counter question to that is obviously with real world assets, for the most part, all the products that I'm seeing, you have to KYC ML. So how does that counter act your positioning based on, you know, allowing anyone and everyone to participate? Do you see a separate world where everyone has to be KYC to AML'd? I don't like calling finance with real world assets DeFi because it's not fully decentralized. I've sort of, just because it's not really a good term for it, I've started trying to call that neo finance. And just it's because it's a new way of doing traditional finance. I would say that definitely kind of each the different issuers and tokenizers of real world assets, they're sort of picking uh, what their regulatory approach will be. And I think different jurisdictions have different rules on who can participate and who, can, who cannot. KYC seems to be present everywhere, but the other parts of the regulatory compliance process that to follow are different uh, based on their setups. And so like, I do think it's important to be like, this is not fully decentralized, but I think there are parts of it that are open and permissionless, right? So even if like, if you have to be permission to create the real world asset, supplying liquidity to borrowing against it, that would be just sort of like a compound or Aave style money market. That doesn't really require that, that may not require the same compliance process. Got it. So it really depends on the money market, right? Because some money markets may want counterparties to be KYC as well. Yeah, like like I think it's sort of like there are like no high level rules that can be applied to everyone at the yeah. same time. But it is sort of like a hybrid in that some parts of the system will require some compliance approaches and others will require different compliance approaches. Recently, Gabriel Shapiro, GC at Delphi, he tweeted out a long manifesto, I think a couple of days ago. And he he said there there's really three types of RWAs that exist. One is like real securities. Two is ownership titles to off-chain assets, and three is receipts, certificates of deposits of an off-chain asset. He says real real securities are very hard to natively uh, launch uh, on-chain. So, like let's say a Microsoft stock, right? Like Microsoft already issued a stock, and porting that over is going to be very hard, right? Without violating security laws. So you see the, these weird hybrids, such as like USDC and USDT, which is a representation of of a stablecoin, uh, a representation of the dollar. And he said, that's okay. Two is ownership titles uh, to off-chain assets. It will really depend on, like, can you really tokenize uh, a deed to a property, right? Like, and what are the laws that are around it? And will it withhold within, with a layer one or blockchain? He's bearish on that. What he's bullish on is receipts and certificates of deposits of on-chain assets. So this is similar to like, super, oh, I'm sorry, off-chain assets. Thank you. Which is similar to what uh, Robert Leshner is doing with, uh, with Superstate, right? Uh, which is he's an investment manager, right? He has a fund administrator. He'll talk to investors, KYC them, take the capital and give them like a private portal where they can purchase uh, treasure bills, right? And then they will be issued a, a token and that token can be freely traded. Do you agree with that thesis or how do you kind of see the the regulatory, like how do you see the onboarding of types of real world assets? Does that resonate with you? Do you disagree with that statement? Like, how do you see that? I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. And I'm also not an RWA issuer. I'm more just like trying to build the infrastructure for all the lawyers and compliance people. At the you, you represent issuers. the builders. Yeah. You, you represent the builders. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. the, the third case like rings pretty true to me. Okay. And then it feels like a lot of people are kind of like working within that model. I'm more just like when I approach things, I'm thinking this is just like very cloudy. And like, there's like, this is a new thing. And so it's really hard, like good rule making hasn't happened for it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of just approach it that, I mean, I, I like, you know, Gabriel is like, he's a smart dude. And so like, I think that's a pretty good perspective, but at the same time, I, I kind of know in my head, probably over the next two to five years, there will be a lot of clarity or hopefully there'll be a lot of clarity. Um, and just adjust, adjust as like that stuff sort of becomes like, as you learn more, like just adjust how, how you're doing things at that point. 
you know, any new technology, you're sort of like waiting for like how it will be regulated. I definitely have a question for Gabriel. I don't quite understand the difference between uh, putting a stock on chain and putting U.S. treasuries on chain. Like both are securities, um, but he somehow puts them in two separate categories. But anyway, that's for another day. Yeah. I, I, I would uh, be wrong, but I, I think the difference is like, are you trading the the literal stock or are you trading like a deposit receipt for a stock? That's exactly right. And like, I don't know, like even like in traditional finance, like, and I don't know if this will qualify under his framework, but like American depository receipts trade pretty well on other stock exchanges. And there are like depository receipts for foreign stocks on US markets. So like, I don't know if that's a problem. Speaking of uh, ADRs, I feel like ADRs are like a tokenized, like bridging a, a stock into a, into a different chain kind of thing, right? Because you take a foreign stock and put it into the American system. It's literally like bridging. Yeah. And- yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, it's it seems like a good model. It seems like it works well. Yeah. So we, we mentioned a bunch of like uh, asset classes, right? Like stocks, treasuries, and, and blah, blah, blah. And is there any one or two asset classes asset classes that you are particularly excited about to tokenize? Yeah, so I think there's like two sort of like profiles. I think short term T bills are really interesting in, on protocols because they're really safe and they don't have much duration. So like, you know, when you're looking at like TLT or like super long gated bonds, like they're going up and down a lot. Uh you know, T bills like be very probably a global apocalypse event, right? If like T bills went down by twenty percent in a day, and then the other types of assets are like things that once you get a little bit farther out on like the risk and liquidity tail, like boring types of assets, but assets that like don't have liquid secondary markets and like don't have that many players that are securitizing them in traditional finance. Think about like auto loan market. SMB receivables, trade financing, like these types of things that aren't like as huge as like treasuries or mortgage backed securities or like high grade corporate debt, but are maybe a little sleepier, probably a little more efficient cost structures. That's kind of like where I think like protocols will maybe have, and the crowdsourcing that comes with protocols might have like the biggest efficiency gains of a traditional yeah. finance. So on your second point, I completely agree. And in fact, Imran, in our uh, request for startups, I, I wrote exactly this as the reason for RWAs, which is to create a liquid secondary market for those traditional assets that don't already have a liquid a secondary market. Uh, on your first point, T-bills, um, on-chain T-bills. So like right now we have, there's like Undo, there's I have a, a few other names. Maple. Does Maple do T-bills today? Yeah, Maple. They- I believe so. Yeah, they do. Okay. Um, yeah, tax receivables, market making, and then T bills. Okay, so I, I have in my notes uh, on the on the matrix matrix dog, Open Eden, and you mentioned uh, Maple. So there's a bunch of them that that do uh, uh, tokenized T bills, and, and the TVL is pretty high. It's like over a hundred million dollars that order of magnitude. Yeah. And my question is, who are the buyers? Like, who actually owns these T- on chain T bills today? I think you sort of have like two epochs in like RWAs so far. And I would say the first one was a lot of RWA startups looking to like solve an access problem on the T-bill side of the access problem. There might be people that don't have access to Fed Direct. Um, and that, that was like interesting. And I'm really happy those teams were building uh, that. I, I think what we're starting to see now also though is kind of this like uh, T-bills is kind of like an asset in protocols. Um, which like, I know, like, um, Ando's, uh, has flux protocol, um, where you can post your tables and get liquid against them. And, and then for Kanto, we're sort of integrating, uh, tables into a Kanto lending market, um, with Fortuna Fi and hash notes, uh, tokenized tables so far and kind of using that as like, um, as, as sort of like the backing for note, which is like Kanto's, uh, unit of account token, kind of like uh- that. So, so maybe uh, to expand my, uh, on my question, I've always wondered where the demand comes from because that, that, for me, that is the biggest challenge for all RWS. Yes, you can tokenize on-chain, but where does the demand come, come from? Who are the buyers? So are the buyers of T-bills, on-chain T-bills today, are they those who are, let's say, based in emerging markets, they need high-quality assets, 
uh, that yields 5%? Or are they more like crypto native on chain organizations that need some treasury diversification or something like that? Any visibility? I'm not completely sure. Um, what I do know is there's a lot of people lending stable coins to DeFi protocols for APRs that are actually below the T bill rate um, right now. And then they're also taking smart contract risk yep. um, to do that. And so I feel like just if, if you can own a token that's probably a bit better, um, just given where that yield is right now. So like, I'm not completely sure exactly where all that who those depositors are. Um, but what I do think is true is that kind of like having on-chain assets that kind of give you that, give you a yield that's similar to the overnight riskless rate is pretty important for using in finance. And that's kind of like, what I'm more excited about that I am less excited about the access problem, even though I think it's important. It's just how it gets me out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. When uh, speaking about demand, there's two things that, that come to mind. Uh, one is everyone is trying to figure out who's providing the uh, LP or, or liquidity for Uniswap, especially taking all the toxic order flow, right? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of that that's happening on Uniswap. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like pro DeFi protocols ac across the board, you know, you see upwards of 100, 200, 300 million TV out. Um, I think in, um, within real world assets, you see 200 million in, in Ondo, you're seeing 100 million in like realty and, and it, it kind of like spread across. I'd say there's about like couple, like a, a billion plus in TVL in real world assets. And I think partly a lot of these uh, users are, are crypto whales that have been successful uh, over the past few years. Um, there's actually an underground trading group, many underground trading groups that uh, I've learned about that are actively providing markets for, for these protocols, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, number two, which is, I think, with the, the current macro status of, of raising interest rates, um, it's actually a strong tailwind for DeFi. Um, because now you have this pull effect of people that want to get access to interest rates or the yield uh, by T-bills, and they're willing to do whatever they can to get access to the to the yield. Because if you could compare it to the yield on, on DeFi, it's like, I don't know, three to five, three to four percent maybe. Uh, and if you get access to the T-bills, then you're getting, you know, five upwards of five percent. Yeah. And so I think what's happening also is that this can also become a tailwind to help accelerate RWAs across the board. Do you find that thesis to be true? And do you think this is going to hold? I mean, generally, if you look at how much money is in stable coins and then multiply that by like the overnight rate, that's how much people are like losing by doing nothing. And so I think, I mean, just like the more expensive that gets, the more likely those people will do a thing. So, I mean, I, I would, that definitely kind of rings true to me. Um, personally, like I'm more excited about kind of like pulling people in from traditional finance especially people that are like currently experiencing like the somewhat inefficient cost structures in traditional finance and bringing them on chain. But yeah, there's a lot of money in stablecoin that's just earning a big zero. So why wouldn't they do something better? It makes pretty good sense to me. Just moving aside from the traditional assets like um, uh, treasuries, we're starting to see like structured credit, commercial real estate. Um, I was just scrolling through Centrifuge and I'm starting to see different types of offerings, you know, even carbon offsets. And so I guess the question is, you know, yes, you know, securities, bonds, T-bills, et cetera, make a lot of sense. What about for the rest of the asset classes? And is there enough structural demand for, for those types of products? I think it depends. I think a lot of people sort of approach RWAs in that I'm going to put these tokens on chain and then people would just want to buy them. Yeah. Um, I don't think sort of like the pet rock approach is going to work that well with those assets because most of the people that kind of like want to get in and learn about those assets enough, they probably can just buy them elsewhere and they can buy them through like traditional finance channels, which are probably more competitive today and also don't carry private key risk. I think where it starts to change is when you can do something with those assets when you own them on chain that you can't do with traditional finance. And if the people need that thing, there's going to be a strong incentive to own that asset on chain. Um, and for me, that answer is like financing and being able to borrow against them and lever up on like an asset class you like or yield you think is too high. Let me rephrase Imran's question. 
So there's all these asset classes around the world. I want to ask you one at a time if you're bullish or bearish uh, when it comes to tokenizing them. I know you you don't necessarily have a have a good answer, but I, I'm curious what your hunch says. Uh, so let's start with our real estate. I haven't seen a model that works well yet. I think it's completely possible someone will invent one, and when they do, I'll be super excited. Mm-hmm. I just like uh, it just hasn't come across my desk something that's like, oh, this just works. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. Now, what about uh, precious metals or industrial metals like gold, silver, but also like lithium, like these things? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't get it. You don't get it. Okay, so yeah. you don't you don't believe in it. I like, I'm not like super bearish. I'm just like I don't understand why that's better. yeah. What about Pokemon cards and Magic the Gathering cards? I'm too old for those. I think I don't know. Ima, Ima, I know you have some thoughts uh, on your uh, Michael Jordan cards. I'm bullish on collectibles. Yeah, uh, it's a six trillion dollar market. Um, I mean, it ranges obviously from sneakers all the way to like you know, musicians signing off on vinyls, uh, and then you know you have art as well that's included in that. Um, so I do think that there is an ability for people to, and we're starting to see this with Courtyard, right, Cho? Yeah. And uh, I think Magic Eden recently launched the ability to buy packs, Pokemon packs that have been wrapped. Yep. Uh, that's custodied by companies like Brinks. Yep. And you could easily buy and sell these packs and then you could redeem it to open up the pack that will be sent to your house. Yep. So I'm quite bullish on that. I asked you earlier, Imran, if you remember, uh, why why you would hold the token rather than the physical card itself. And and you said two two things. One is you were worried about humidity and uh, and heat, which could yeah, damage, know, the cards. damage the cards. And then the other reason is uh, you're worried about theft. Yeah. And so both problems can be solved with uh, if you have a trusted custodian. Yep. Yeah, like, but don't you lose the chance to put it on your bedroom dresser and look at it every day? Well, it depends on how much you have, right? You could always have one that could you could hang on the wall. Oh, you could just create an NFT and then I'll just have a... It's <laughs> oh, the same. It's the same. It's the same. <laughs> no, like, I, I, I think it, if, if, like... Yeah, like markets like that, uh, you know, like in sneakers, there's like people, there's like financial speculators sort of collectors, but they're also like hoping the sneaker they buy, they can flip it later. And then there's like people that just wear them, right? And like, I think, I mean, I could see if there's like a, if you can bifurcate the market from the speculators and like the end users, or the end collectors, you could create more efficiencies for the speculators and the traders and the markets. Like, I just don't know if anyone's done that yet, but it doesn't mean that it can't. Just maybe it's been a little too early on some of the prior tries. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I I would consider like collectibles being an emerging world asset sector as well. Like collectibles, like blue cards. And I mean, Pokemon, or if you just think about Pokemon, there's a very strong user base of diehard cult fanatics that, that love Pokemon. And that could extend across many different IPs and brands across the board. I don't disagree with that. It's just a hard bootstrapping problem. Cause like if right now all the collectors go to like a less efficient system like eBay or is that the market center right now in these types of collectibles? So eBay is the market place where you could buy and sell cards. Yes. Like the physical item. Yeah. Um, but there's also this company called Courtyard or Magic Eden, you know, Magic Eden, where they uh, use a custodian like Brinks, where they uh, store the actual packs and cards, and then the digital item exists on these marketplaces where people can buy and sell. If you think about like who wins in a market like that, I sort of think of that as like, okay, whoever has that relationship with like the real customer. And I think the real customer is that person that, comes and they buy one and they, they put it on their bedroom dresser or they frame it and they put it in their living room or something. And like getting that person to stop just typing in eBay and looking at what's there and getting them to go to Courtyard or Magic Eden or the different website is challenging. Like it's not an impossible burden. It's not like an impossible uh, like hurdle to get over, but it, it might be hard and expensive. There's a... There's a wine uh, RWA company that we talked to. It's super interesting. I'll tell you the, the thesis. It's very interesting. So there is people who want to collect wine and have exposure to wine prices, expensive wine, premium wine. 
Um, but because they're based in Singapore, there's an import tax. So if you add, if you if you want to have exposure to one prices previously without tokenization, you would have to pay a huge uh, import tax. And so with tokenization, you can just leave the one where where it was, whether it's in France or California, and you save like 30, 40%. That's nice. Super interesting thesis. Yes, yeah, sort of like the the art like the art warehouses. Like the art like you basically buy the art and just ship it to your offshore warehouse and then keep it there. Yeah, that is pretty interesting. Do they end up import importing it eventually to drink it? Or just like you drink it when you visit California? You can choose to. So like similar, so like the wine and also the Pokemon cards and whatever, all these collectibles and art, you can, you can do create redeem as long as you, you have the token. So you have the token, you can redeem the, the physical item, nice. uh, et cetera. Nice. I mean, it sounds fun. It is fun. <laughs> Antonio from DYDX said, we need to move away from obsession with porting real world assets <laughs> to crypto and double down on fundamentally new things I saw crypto that. enables. <laughs> Thoughts, reactions? Okay. No, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's like humans need to borrow money from each other. It's like <laughs> capital formation to do things with those capital is like something that's been going on for thousands of years. And it will be continue to be one of like the most important like reasons why humans need money. So like, like, yeah, we can like do like JPEGs, like we can put JPEGs on chain, like we can put like these internet only things, right? Like visual NFTs, like, you know, DYDX doing like perp swaps on like crypto coins, right? Like all of these like things to do around stuff that exists on the internet. And that stuff's interesting. Like for me personally, I see crypto rails as kind of being the next, uh, the next financial infrastructure uh, for like how the economy of the world runs. And so like to say, we're just going to ignore like all of the real economy forever. is just kind of like, eh, I don't know. Like, obviously I like the internet, they, they finance around internet native things, but I don't think it's like most of the market. And, I mean, uh, we're to have validation of this, which is stable coins. Like that's the elephant in the room. Stable coin is RWA. And and guess what? Last year, stablecoins settled eleven trillion dollars, and 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 guess how much PayPal settled? Like one point four. So stablecoin has already surpassed PayPal by seven times. Like there's no better validation than than, than this. Yeah, and I mean also like most of DeFi is really stablecoins versus protocol tokens too. Like obviously there are a lot of like tokens trading at Seth, but like the meat of the market. In like perps, DeFi lending, and on DEXs is stablecoins versus, versus, versus like F when it's on F, stablecoin versus Sol when it's on Solana. So, like, I don't think you're going to really do it. So, to me, it seems like um, why real world assets or traditional assets should exist on chain, to me, it seems like you could get more demand for, for these assets. Right now, the demand is localized in different markets across the world, right? So the U.S. market is primarily U.S. market, and those that want to get access to it, you have to be maybe ultra wealthy, or you need to have an investment manager that could get access to the to this to the structured products or or stocks or securities, or if you're savvy. And so, to me, it seems like the ease of getting access to world assets will be an order of magnitude easier, and so that people can get access to these assets. I would sort of push back. I would say that is definitely okay. sort of the 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 epoch one of RWAs. And this access problem, uh, I would say in my mind, I think EBOC2 though is actually uh, removing, using protocols to re- to decrease the friction on counterparties finding each other. Well, it, yeah, because you're opening it up to everyone, right? So people can, like, uh, like an open yes. RQ system, right? I, I would almost, yes, but if, like, let's say we just have everyone in the world that trades mortgage backed securities, right? And tokenizations of that MBS all existed on chain, right? And let's just assume in our little thought experiment that all of the counterparties and people doing the transacting in MBS also were comfortable transacting on chain. Would they choose to transact on chain with protocols or would they choose to transact through like traditional methods with like the contracts and the clearing facilities they currently have? 
Um, I think the on-chain protocols are going to be way more efficient, but there's an enormous problem in that the existing traditional, more efficient traditional finance system has all the counterparties. Everyone's on board to the financial facilities. Um, they have the is with each other. And so that network effect is strong. And so it will probably be a very, very long time before there's anything that's competitive on chain for something that's as like developed as that. But I think the on chain version would have lower frictions if it had all the counterparties and MDS issuers and the originators already on board. And so I, I sort of think of it as just kind of a matter of time until the bigger, like the, the more efficient systems eat away at the less efficient systems. And I wouldn't start with MBS either because it's like a very mature market with lots of counterparties and, and a good amount of competition. So to summarize, one is demand and then also the cost efficiencies yeah. uh, across the board. Yeah, like the cost structures, like it's just getting onboarded to be able to trade something like MBS is very expensive and the barriers are very high. Getting a loan against MBS you own is is a pretty high bar. And if you want to switch who is financing you, like who your prime brokerage was, that would also be a very long process. If you compare that to what's on DeFi, right? With like just like like if you wanted to do finance with F, Ave is not paying any money to onboard you to deposit a bit of F and borrow dollars against it. And your switching costs, if you want to switch from Ave to compound. Is just like two or three transactions in five minutes. And so it's just like radically, the competition is like orders of magnitude closer to perfect competition than you see in traditional finance. And so it's really a question of like, okay, so how do you bootstrap individual markets to have enough counterparties of that market on chain to where the better competition can take over and pull the rest of the market into the smaller network effect with more efficient cost structures. Talking a little bit about the future, after T-bills, what do you think might be the most, uh, the, the asset class that's the most likely to, to get tokenized and succeed on chain? Sleepier markets that are like boring, but also high yielding, like markets where you're not, it's not like a frontier market where you're worried if this loan defaults, will I be able to actually get a recovery rate over zero, right? Like if if we're lending in countries with like a less to less less of a tradition of rule of law, right? That might be problematic. But I think if you think about other markets, like small and medium uh, American businesses, right? And they have receivables, mm -hmm. they need the cash now, so they'll put those receivables up and borrow against them. Right, those sorts of markets, uh, interest rates on notes in those markets, you know, can be 15, 16, 17 percent. And it's not, it's on Maple now, it's on Maple now for 14 percent. Yeah, yeah, like exactly like that, that type of stuff. And it's like, um, you know, like, like maybe not mortgages, right? But something like auto loans is a much smaller market, right? And, and a bit more efficient relative to the mortgage market. And so, like, those sorts of sleepy, not as big, more inefficient markets are the thing with with less counterparties currently transacting are kind of like what I think the markets that will be the best. Putting RWAs to the side, where do you see um, other sectors taking off? I know uh, before we started our, our recording, we talked about uh, music NFTs. Um, and obviously, music NFTs are interesting because you have uh, sound.xyz, uh, that was probably the forerunner in this uh, that started with kind of minting NFTs. Now they have a tiered approach where you could buy maybe a set of 30 music NFTs and then the rest could be minted for free as a way to increase distribution. You also have Vault that's launched on Solana that's taking more of a traditional approach of buying albums. And I feel like you have a lot of insights around this because that's probably the next market you're looking at. So uh, maybe give us a high level overview of music NFTs and like, why are you bullish? I think music NFTs, it's sort of like they have so much potential, but they haven't done that well. And it's like, why? I, I think they have tons of potential because the emotional connection people have with music is probably, is, is like more intense 
than the emotional attachment people will have with a picture. And we've seen this like drive to collect picture and JPEG NFTs, like CryptoPunks, Born Apes, many others. But we haven't seen that same drive to collect music NFTs. And so it's like, for me as a builder, I'm sort of trying to figure out, hey, why does this seem thing feel like it should work so well, but it's not working so well? And kind of like, I see a couple key, two key problems. One, the, a lot of music NFTs are incompatible with traditional distribution. Yeah. Like Spotify, like if you make a really, really good song and put it on music NFTs, it's not like a clear, like coherent path to also using that song in traditional distribution, unless you sort of just issue a copy of that song as an NFT. And if like I'm listening to that song in Spotify and it's on like my like list and I feel like this is one of my favorite songs, what does the extra copy of that song do for me? I think for some people it does appeal and there are a lot of people that really like collecting music NFTs, but I think for a lot of people it's like, what what is this, what is this doing? And so like me just kind of as a builder trying to kind of solve that, those two problems to hopefully realize the potential. And so like, I'm kind of thinking about music NFTs as being like, you have to create a format that's both completely compatible yeah. with how music gets out normally for, for like a mainstream artist while also giving something people something that they can, uh, that they can own that they can't just have in Spotify and like it's theirs and other people don't have 50 copies of it. That's really interesting because if you think about why JPEGs have taken off, images are by default compatible with all the social media. Like you can just put a picture on, on the Twitter, right? Yeah. You can post it on Reddit, on Instagram or whatever. It's completely compatible. Whereas music is music and NFTs are not today. Very yeah. good insight. Finding a format that kind of does both. But how does that work though? I mean, like if you look at streaming, um, like I think most people stream today, right? Um, so Spotify and, and Apple music. Yeah. So that's the current format today. You could stream through YouTube. You could stream through, I mean, I, I think the old, older generation probably has MP3s. But in the post-music NFT world, what would that format look like? There's been some some projects that have kind of worked in this direction in, on the format side, but maybe not pairing it with traditional distribution. But kind of the format I settled on is essentially, let's say you make 10 songs that would kind of be the album. But the pieces of that song are kind of interchangeable like Legos. And so kind of like your uh, your kicks, your snares, the hi-hats, they kind of have a common structure. The chord progressions in the song, you know, the, the songs have the same tempo. There's like modular structure of the songs. And the way the chord progressions work, every chord progression kind of fits with all the bass lines, right? And so essentially it has like we create kind of this collage of sounds but it's like an album's worth of material and then that collage of sounds could be recombined into 10 coherent songs or uh, 10,000 coherent songs which is kind of your nft collection and then from those 10,000 songs 10 of them might be the official album version and so sort of like because it's an album and a, like a collage or an album from a collage we're gonna call it an allage and it kind of juxtaposes the way music NFTs work now and that sometimes like if you did distribute the song on Spotify, the music NFT is just kind of like a sidecar copy of that single on Spotify. What we want to do with the Elage is kind of the Elage is the whole body of the artist's work, but the album on Spotify is like a subset of the true art that you collect when you buy the individual song NFTs. And so kind of maintaining the structure where when the artist creates songs, so it's just become part of their catalog and they just stand right alongside all the other songs in that, on that artist's artist Spotify page, while also having a deeper experience to really go deeper into the art. If you want to explore the way the artist, that artist meant for them all to be recombined in the Elash and kind of make the NFT format kind of be the deeper meaning of the music while making the traditionally distributed music still completely coherent and able to stand on its own. Interesting. So the way this would work is you would have to work hand in hand with the artist and the artist would release an album, a sta very standard album, right? Yeah. On Spotify and Apple Music. 
but this will also be on chain and there'll be 10,000 different copies that could be minted out of this original album, all with very unique changes to the tones of the music, right? Or the background of the music, exactly. or the vocals, et cetera. So the generative piece, let's say, yes. right? And then those 10,000 copies are minted and exclusive to the super fans that are, that are holding that copy. Yes. And some of those copies could be enhanced, right? Like, I mean, sometimes you listen to music, you're like, well, I like the vocals, but I don't really like the background music. Yeah. And so you could change it to the point where the user is like, oh, I actually like this copy much more for myself. I mean, yeah, I would, I would hope so. Because you can imagine like, I don't know if, if any of you listen to like, yeah, it's sort of like different remixes, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Or like uh, definitely dating myself, but you know, Nirvana Unplugged album. Yeah. Uh, versus like the original production of songs. Yeah, I, I mean, many, uh, I've seen these special albums, right, that release, pre-release before the original album, and they may have this extra song that's included, and you have to buy that album just to get that extra song. But in this case, it's like 10 x in that, right, which is like, yeah. you as a fan have the ability to create unique music based on my vocals and my background, and that's spe specific to you, and that could hold unique value because that's the only copy that's available. Yeah, like like in one song, the middle section of the song might might include like a jazz piano solo, right? Yeah. And another copy of the song, you know, there might be more like, uh, you know, it might be like an improv synth and just kind of like pulls out great. And so trying to find a different way to allow people to kind of experience the artist's intention, intent, and have kind of like a deeper way to explore the work, and also hopefully have a way to kind of form an emotional con connection that's kind of like more meaningful very interesting um so what does this mean for like on-chain generative music i mean you had euler beats that first launched if you remember that where you have the masters then you could mint the lps and then they also release another collection called futura so that's like pure just like generative music right yeah and then you have in parallel sound music and sound xyz that's creating like indie art yeah and that's primarily like, you know, a different way to distribute to super fans. The super fans thesis, which is, you know, anyone that likes our music can mint for free, but the super fans get the actual copy of this song. And that's only specific to you. So that's kind of what's happening in a space right now. Do you see that merging? Is that what it is? Like, you know, could you see Euler Beats importing music or background into these types of songs? Like, where does it yeah, all kind I, of go? I would say it's sort of like a little bit of a hybrid. Um, okay. Like o Euler Beats, I, I think was really going all in on like the beat is like literally algorithmically generated. Yes. Um, I think that was really interesting. Was a fan of Euler Beats as a project. I'm not sure that I would like put an Euler Beat like on my playlist to listen Same. to in the car, if that makes sense. And so like I'm sort of. I, but I think there was a lot of like magic in that, if that makes sense. And so kind of finding a way to get that while also getting like the chance that, hey, this could like literally be your favorite song at the same time. And so kind of like maybe hybrid, hybrid approach. Maybe if, if it works, it might end up looking like the best of both worlds. Cool. Well, um, I think we're at time. Any final thoughts, words um, that you want to leave our audience with? <laughs> don't get too confident in anything because uh, <laughs> it's just a very everything's really new and you know yeah things can change very quickly cool scott thanks so much for your time and uh for those that want to reach out to scott you can find him on twitter uh he's working on contos as well and that's uh something you can find on his on his profile thanks so much for joining and we'll catch you next time All right, thanks y'all really appreciate it thanks <laughs> thanks for listening to good game don't forget to subscribe we'll see you next week